Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Marion Keys means many things to many readers. That's what The Independent recently wrote, impressively listing among them a household name, a multi-million selling literary phenomena, and your sister's favorite writer. Many of her readers consider themselves to be full-on fans. Since the publication of her first novel in 1995, Keyes has become a fixture on the bestseller lists. Crowned the voice of a generation by Cosmopolitan, for the past three decades, 35 million readers and counting have fallen in love when grown up with the Walsh family and their inventor, superstar author Marion Keyes. With The Guardian noting that she's often imitated and is much love for her page turners that tackle weighty contemporary issues with a light touch. One of Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the world's most celebrated comedic wordsmiths, we first meet the Walsh clan in Watermelon, and then subsequent hits like Lucy Sullivan is Getting Married, Rachel's Holiday, Angels, Anybody Out There, The Mystery of Mercy Close, Again Rachel, and Mammy Walsh's A to Z of the Walsh family, along with a popular catalog of best-selling standalone hits including Last Chance Saloon, Sushi for Beginners, No Dress Rehearsals, The Other Side of the Story, Nothing Bad Ever Happens in Tiffany's, the Charming Man, The Brightest Star in the Sky, The Woman Who Stole My Life, The Break, and her celebrated recent release, Grown Ups, which The Guardian crowned a mature piece of work by an accomplished writer who knows how to make serious issues relatable and get a few grown up laughs, too. Two of her books have been made into feature films, and she's the author of powerful nonfiction works, including Under the Duvo, Further Under the Duvo, and Making It Up as I Go Along, which the Irish Times hailed as painfully funny, and her very own cookbook, Saved by Cake, over 80 ways to bake yourself happy. She's here today to talk all about what she calls her accidental empire. Marion, welcome to the show. Now we understand you grew up regaled by a rich history of storytelling within your family home. And how young do you first remember falling in love with reading? There were two in that I grew up in a home where like an awful lot of oral storytelling went on. Um, but it was actually, I'm Irish, um, but it was a, a, an English author, um, Enid Blyton, who, I mean, kind of, Everybody knows her. And it's so funny that she was like the gateway drug for so many people. I don't know what, you know, alchemy went on in her books. But um, yeah, I was about six and I read one of the, the twins at St. Clair's, I think that was it. And like it was instant. It was powerful. You know, I fell in love and I became a reader right away. And the house I grew up in didn't have a lot of money. So, you know, like books were, they, you know, it wasn't a house where like lots of books were lying around. So, you know, birthday presents and Christmas presents for me were always books. But unbeknownst to myself, I was also getting like a free education in how to construct narrative, like how to use humor to make a point. Uh, because my mother is an amazing oral storyteller um, and humor is very important to her. And I suppose to my entire family. So I had this dual thing going on. Did you soon find your own flair for making up stories safe for friends or siblings? Kind of. I'd sort of forgotten about that. I mean, a lot of my friends were also readers. So, yeah. I mean, and I always found reality kind of disappointing. Um, so definitely. I mean, yeah, I was a liar, uh, to put it another way. Um, and... You know, this is obviously something that, you know, is not that I feel ashamed of. But I know other authors who have said the same thing, that like just reality wasn't adequate. Um, it just wasn't enough. Um, but it never occurred to me that a person like me could be a storyteller for a living. I just thought it was something you did in your spare time. What about in the classroom and then the instructors who recognized your gift early and rooted it on? nothing it was the complete opposite um i'm 59 and the ireland i grew up in was very very controlling um and a sort of any kind of imaginative thought was very discouraged you know anything in any way transgressive was really shamed and clamped down on um you know i do remember like a couple of times in english class i wrote some essays that I thought were kind of interesting and, and outside the mold. And I was completely shamed for it. Um, you know, and that's just the way it was. I mean, this what happened to me was nothing like the, the worst thing that ever happened to anyone under, you know, I mean, we lived in a theocracy. But it was, you know, I mean, and you can see like 
the people that were famed, you know, if you, if you say Irish, Irish writers, you know, it's like the dead white men, you know, like that poster just pops up, you know, and like they all struggled. I mean, they left Ireland or they had, you know, really complicated relationships with alcohol or, you know, it was not Ireland was not an easy place to be in any way creative. And obviously I'm, you know, younger than those people. But that kind of that thinking, like we were given a very, very rigid template in which to do our thinking within. As a teenager, who were a few of your favorite authors or say music artists that helped your creative development along when you look back on it now? I mean, like like every pretentious teenager goes around with a, a copy of 1984 under their oxter. But um, I suppose, yeah, I do remember, you know, 1977. It was very exciting to see like the Sex Pistols, you know, not be afraid. I mean, you know, obviously they were in a different country with a completely different sensibility. But I think, you know, the huge thing I think that liberated so many Irish people was just mass media, you know, like having having television, you know, like we could see what was happening in other countries. Uh, we could see that other people weren't controlled the way we were. Um, definitely, it gave my generation more courage than the previous generation would have had. Readers are first introduced to the beloved Walsh family clan in your first published novel, Watermelon which the New York Times hailed as an eccentric romantic comedy full of wicked humor, and Mademoiselle magazine cheered on as a bloody good page turner. Please pull the curtain back if you would on any autobiographical muse that maybe helped inspire the loved among fans, Claire Walsh. That's my first novel, and I really, all I can see is like all the mistakes and, and, and the absolute amateur hour quality of it. Um, but I'll tell you what um, was motivating me. I was young-ish, you know, I was in, I, would, I had just turned 30. And it was, it was after, after the second wave of feminism, and we were all post-feminists, and I had been told, you know, that the world, you know, is as good for me as it is for men, I can do anything, I can be anyone, I can earn what I want, you know, sexually, I can, I can do what I like without judgment. And all the novels, that I was reading were very about these kind of, they were very wish fulfillment. They were about these incredibly powerful women. And I was living in London, earning a pittance in that kind of really awkward space of wanting to say I was a feminist, but also wanting a boyfriend. Like it's a very, very awkward one to be in. And I felt I am so, I felt like there was nobody telling my story. And also, as you say, um, like I am, um, yeah, I suffer from depression. And, and as it happened, um, just before I started writing my first novel, I had been to rehab for alcoholism. And so I kind of, I thought lots of things, but I thought I'm a 30 year old woman, which felt ancient, but actually wasn't. I'm not seeing my world or my life reflected in, in, in popular fiction. Also, I thought, I'm middle class, I have a degree, I'm an alcoholic, surely I can't be the only one. So I just wanted to write about a woman like me with those kind of, with all of those characteristics. And I had no idea at the time that I was just vocalizing how it was for so many, for so many women in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, and, but, but I mean, I wasn't the only one, like there was obviously a sort of a, how would you call it? A, a wave of women feeling, why aren't we being written about? Like even women's magazines, it was all, they were all acting like we had this incredibly fabulous life. And like we didn't. Um, so it, it was, you know, timing. I, I think I was lucky. I was very, very lucky in that the time that I wrote the book was the, the time that like people were ready you know, to read about the reality, I suppose, of post-feminism. Were you already envisioning a series early on? And please introduce viewers who haven't met them to the Walsh family tree. And I suppose the obvious question is, how much do these characters mirror your own family members? I had no plan for world domination. Like, I really hadn't. And they say everybody's first novel is, is the most autobiographical. And I come from a family of five. And guess what? There are five siblings in the Walshes. I mean, it was tragic, really. I mean, and I'm the eldest of my family and Claire's the eldest Walsh. Um, 
but the various characters in of the Walsh's don't correspond directly to characters of the Keyses. But that dynamic of, you know, big characters and, you know, opinionated people and a kind of, um, what's the word, almost like bickering as a hobby. And I mean, the mother, I think the, the matriarch is always a very powerful figure in, in Ireland and in Irish writing. And I mean, my mother is like that. And, you know, there's a, a many contradictions about my mother that also appears in Mammy Walsh uh, in that like they're both very devout, but they both absolutely hate the whole idea of cooking and keeping house. You know, they, they crave glamour, but at the same time, they would deny it. Um, and my dad was more of a, you know, a, a background figure. And, and, and so it was with Daddy Walsh. So, but I wrote what I knew, I suppose, which is what they say to do, at least initially. And, um, and I just feel so lucky that there were five sisters to eventually write about. Um, because of all the books I've written, they're the ones that I want to return to. They're the ones I miss. And I suppose they're the ones that I feel most at home with because that, that dynamic of... I mean, I'm very close with my siblings, you know, and I mean, obviously the relationships are complicated because all human relationships are, but we are very in touch with each other. You know, we we're quite enmeshed in a way that probably isn't healthy, but that I love. Um, and so that that kind of. That style of relationship is in all the Walsh books. It must have then put a smile on all of your real family spaces to hold copies of your first published book, knowing they helped inspire its characters. How big was yours the day you saw it for the first time? I mean, I don't know if you're old enough to remember phone books, but like I, I remember the excitement of seeing our family's name in the phone book. You know, like I felt like genuinely like a very inconsequential person and that, and you know, I never expected that life would I don't know that anything kind of important or good would happen to me. Um, it was the weirdest thing. Like even now, sometimes, you know, to see my name on on a cover or in a newspaper or something, it's like it's kind of out of body. It's like, oh, my God, that's me because. I don't know. Yeah, because I never felt worth it. And. And I mean, I'm so grateful that this is my job and that I'm allowed to do it and that people are so kind to me. But I don't know if anything really changes us fundamentally. Um, you know, I've changed as I've aged um, and uh, as I've lived, but I'm not sure that success can just kind of come along and, you know, kind of pull out that that kind of that broken bit or, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't, that's not to sound ungrateful or anything. It's simply interesting um, that like we are who we are, regardless of our circumstances. Um, and really, I don't mean to sound ungrateful. I'm so grateful. It was incredible. Like, you know, it, but like genuinely, it still is. Um, and it was so lovely for my entire family as well. We look forward to airing Marion's full episode in an upcoming season on a streaming network. But for now, we're so excited to talk with her about her latest releases. Again, Rachel marks your first sequel, and Rachel Walsh has come a long way since readers first met her in Watermelon. And the Telegraph found in these pages a real genius in the way Keyes brings deep, awful truths to the surface. While at the same time, London's The Observer added of your latest bestseller that it has all of Keyes' trademark wit, humor, and whip-smart dialogue, but it's also a novel teeming with compassion and redemption. Is it a conscious process for you while you're working to balance blending all of that in? Rachel is the first sequel I wrote. I really had never planned to do one because I don't believe in them. Um, and I don't know, enough time had passed. And uh, and I suppose because, uh, you know, Rachel's in recovery, I'm in recovery. Nobody really writes about long-term recovery. When people get well, it's, you know, at the end of a, a kind of an addiction book, you either get well or you die. But nobody writes about what it's like, you know, two years in, five years in. So, it was so lovely 
you know, to revisit the characters. These characters have become so popular throughout the years that both Watermelon and Lucy Sullivan is Getting Married were turned into films, along with a French adaptation of another of your novels, Last Chance Saloon. What's the reality between what viewers might perceive that world to be like and what it actually is? Especially in terms of what gets made versus what doesn't, given so much material gets optioned. I wasn't really part of it at all. The one that was kind of closest to anything was the French one. And that was fun. I was on the set with that for, uh, with them, you know, so it was just like my kind of Irish characters were suddenly, you know, sexy and French. And that was a laugh. But mostly, mostly it's about, I prefer the book. It really bothers me that people treat books as the poor relation that like books don't really matter by themselves that they're only validated once they're made into a kind of a you know a silver screen thing you know like the silver screen thing is excellent in and of itself but books are just as fabulous any preview you can give fans on what they can plan on including in their summer beach bag or winter christmas list next and is the more coming from the walsh family we hope I wrote a, a sequel, my first sequel um, recently. It's a sequel to Rachel's Holiday. And you're absolutely right in that, like, I already knew the characters. They all came with their history. And after that, I had a plan to do an enormous sort of 40 year span about a whole new set of characters. And because the world feels so sharp and pointy and terrifying at the moment, I wanted to stay somewhere comfortable. So I'm doing another Walsh sequel, this time about Anna from anybody out there. And um, I'm at that, you know, I'm terrified, like always terrified. It's good. Terror is a great motivator uh, to try hard. And my other project, which I'm so proud of, is I have a podcast with um, a lovely woman called Tara Flynn, an Irish comedian. And it's called Now You're Asking. And basically, we're agony ants. Um, and people send us problems. Like, and sometimes they're serious and sometimes they're funny. And Tara and I are, you know, have been around the block about 80 times. We have a lot of life experience. Um, it's warm. It's fun and inviting. And it's on, well, it's on BBC Sounds and wherever you get your podcasts. And we're about to start uh, recording another series next month. And we would love if people would listen. And what do they say? Like and subscribe? Whatever the young people say. Those things. Um, but we love we love doing it so much and, and you know, the response has been beautiful. Good Housekeeping has correctly called you one of the most successful Irish authors of all time. Does it ever take you aback to the fact that 35 million readers and counting have embraced your characters and catalog so loyally and really generationally at this point? I was on a plane the other day coming back from somewhere and I just, you know, we landed, we stood up, it's getting me bagged down from the overhead thing. And I just looked around and the woman behind me was putting a copy of Again, Rachel, into her, into her bag. And it was just, I was, it's, it's odd and lovely. Um, and I, I'm obviously incredibly inarticulate when it comes to describing it. But it's, it's like there's two versions of me. You know, there's the one that writes the books and is out there and, you know, doing things like this. And then there's the rest of me, which is kind of the same person I always was. And as you say, it's probably a good thing. I mean, I think it's a very dangerous thing for any, well, for any artist or anyone really, to start believing the hype or, you know, to start believing the best things that are ever said about them. Um, you know, like I still agonize with every book I write. And, and like, it's not pleasant to go through, but it makes me work hard. It makes me try my best. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. And I think that that's good. Um, I want to write decent books. You have a talent for squeezing levity out of even the most tough and darkest moments in your novels. What advice do you have for the aspiring authors on how to write funny? My husband is my first reader, but I will always check with everybody um, to see if something works. I mean, and it's a fine line, you know, because you've got to respect your story. That's more important. Respect your story first. Um, don't throw anything under the bus for a cheap laugh. Don't punch down. Um, be prepared to put something in, take it out, put it back in again, then take it out again. You know, it's... it's mm. And... Juxta bizarre juxtapositions 
work really well. Um, and another thing is the word bathos, which I didn't even know was a word until recently. It's B-A-T-H-O-S. It's not pathos. It's where something very, you make some sort of sweeping statement and then you follow it with something incredibly banal, bland, small. That seems to work well. Um, and dialogue can be really, can be funny. Other people's dialogue there's nothing really as funny or also, I suppose, the internal workings of a very cynical person's mind is also enjoyable. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, keep some warmth in it. it. It's important. You know, you don't want to you don't want to make it too sour. There always has to be a small love of the human race in comedy to make it palatable. Um, and it's a fine line. And that's the whole thing about writing. It's finding that fine line, you know, and we won't always find it because we're human. But making the effort means we have a better chance of getting it right a lot of the time. Beyond that, what other gems of wisdom could you illuminate for us here? Anything I write, it depends on the, the, the first character who comes to me. You can start anywhere. It doesn't have to be the beginning. You know, until you go to your final edit, you can move stuff around. Also, your first efforts will horrify you with how bad they are. Don't worry. You will edit it. You will edit it again. Most of the work is the edit, not the inspiration. You will hit points where you don't know what's going to happen. You either wait it out or you go back a little bit and see, I am um, that happened there and I don't really believe that would happen. Or this person isn't fully formed yet. Be prepared to go back when you can't go forward. Also, be prepared to go down to make your characters more fully fleshed, um, more believable, less perfect. Um, like this happens to me a lot. And, and the, the flaws characterization, I have to go back before I can pick it up and move it forward. Um, every, I mean, it's, it's nearly all about the editing. It's nearly all about the editing. Other small things like, I have a tendency to give too many people's names that begin with the letter A or the letter L. Um, be careful about things like that. Um, don't think that you have to wait for the muse to strike because there isn't a muse. Um, writing is work. I mean, it's very enjoyable work, and but it's challenging. And it means... I, every day, have to sit down at my desk, at my computer, when I don't want to do this. I would rather do anything else and conjure something from nothing because that's what it feels like. And on the days when I can't, which is most of them, I start somewhere else. You know, I, I'll kind of look at a paragraph and go, I see, what can be fixed here? What, how, how can I make this better? And by polishing that, it usually will give me, a, a, you know, a, a gateway into the subconscious, whereas, which is where kind of all creative work comes from. Feel free to do your plot in advance, but also try and don't be too wedded to it because it's unlikely that you'll stick to it. Uh, something will happen that will seem more interesting. And if that's the case, follow it. Um, that's where the true work happens when the unexpected arrives. Don't resist it. If you get a if you get a, a crazy idea, go with it. If it doesn't work, you can just delete it. I know it's agony. You don't have to delete it. I move all my deletable stuff into a file called slush or genius ideas or something like that. You know, um, but it's a process of backwards and forwards of moving things around. Um, of reorganizing timelines. It's constant reshuffling. I think it's a very uncertain process. And once you make peace with that, it'll work. But if you're trying to keep it rigid, you know, rigid chapter lengths, you know, if you say I've got to do like 4,000 words a day, I mean, don't do that to yourself. You know, do like 570 good words, you know, like, you make your own rules. You write it your own way. Do it whatever way you want to do it, but do do it. That is my final thing. You're to do it. Too many people talk about it. 
they want, you know, the, the kind of the magic channel from the universe to open up and land the book in their head. Your book won't get written if you don't write it. So write it. 